conservationist Paul Rosalie set out to be eaten alive by a green anaconda. Some people love snakes, and some people would rather keep their distance from these slithery characters. Snakes seem to inspire a lot of fear, and not just in humans. Most mammals have an inbuilt fear of these sometimes venomous creatures. But let's not characterize snakes as all bad, because they're absolutely fascinating. And in the past, they were even more fascinating and even more terrifying than today. From the mighty Titanoboa to the giant that previously held the title of the biggest snake ever, here we present you 20 prehistoric snakes that are the stuff of nightmares. <sighs> Number 20, Titanoboa. Around 58 million years ago, which is just a few million years after the dinosaurs checked out, Cerrejón, this was massive, swampy jungle. This was like a place where everything was on steroids, bigger, warmer, and way more humid than today. This place had turtles with shells as big as manhole covers, <laughs> and at least three types of crocodile relatives that grew beyond 3.5 meters. And don't get me started on the lungfish. <laughs> they were around two meters long, way bigger than their modern Amazon lungfish cousins. Ruling this jungle was this beastly snake, Titanoboa. We're talking a snake over 12 meters long, weighing more than a thousand kilos. It looked a little like today's boa constrictor, but with the lifestyle of an anaconda living in the water. This swamp dwelling behemoth could easily take down an animal that crossed its path. Slithering along, it had come up to a grown man's waist. Scientists have called it Titanoboa cerrejonsis. It is safe to say that this snake holds the title for the largest snake that ever existed. And if its sheer size isn't impressive enough, its existence might just spill some secrets about Earth's past and maybe give hints about our future. It helps us to figure out the conditions of the planet that allowed such vast growth. When the Cerrejon team stumbled upon it, they knew they hit the jackpot. Titanoboa was as heavy as a small rhino and as lengthy as a school bus. If you don't want to get squeezed into pulp by the mighty Titanoboa, hit like and subscribe. It's like a Titanoboa repellent button. Number 19, Gigantophis garstini. There's also this ginormous snake named Gigantophis garstini, which is, by the way, the only member of the Gigantophis genus that ever existed. But they're extinct now. Before 2009, this snake was basically considered the king of snakes, the biggest one ever. That was until Titanoboa from Colombia stepped into the limelight. Hey, but we all know about that guy already. Around 40 million years ago, Gigantophis garstini was living in what's now the Sahara, specifically where Egypt and Algeria are today. Jason had a guy from the Smithsonian Institution looked into the fossils of this giant snake. He did a side-by-side -side comparison of its vertebrae with the largest snakes we have today. After his study, he figured that this ancient snake might have been anywhere between 9 to 10 meters long. Imagine that! If it indeed was 10 meters, it would have outgrown its closest living kin by more than 10%. But some later estimates, which are based on more specific calculations, think Gigantophis garstini was closer to 7 meters. Our knowledge of this massive snake species isn't vast, it's mostly from a handful of fossils. Back in 1901, paleontologist Charles Williams Andrews let the world know about this snake discovery. He guesstimated it was around 10 meters and gave a tip of the hat to Sir William Garston by naming it after him. In 2013, some people found that Gigantophis vertebrae from Pakistan had close resemblance to those from Egypt. How they're related though, still a mystery. Maybe the snake was a world traveler. Number 18, Najat. So let's talk about Najash. This was a kind of foundational snake that used to live in Patagonia during the late Cretaceous era, specifically in a place called the Calenderos Formation. Sadly, it's extinct now. What's cool about Najash is that like many of its fellow Cretaceous buddies and some present day snakes, it had back legs. <laughs> but Najash had pretty well developed legs extending beyond its rib cage and a pelvis that was still connected to the spine. Researchers found Najash fossils in the Calenderos Formation, situated in Argentina's Rio Negro province. And these remnants are an astonishing 90 million years old. The head structure and backbone of Najash resemble other old-timers <laughs> like Denilicia patagonica and Madstonidae. Certain neck and tail features of both Najash and Denilicia patagonica give us clues about the evolutionary journey of snakes from a lizard-like ancestor. Najash was special because it still had its sacrum, which consists of several connected vertebrae in the pelvis area, and its pelvic girdle. These features are absent in today's snakes and in all known fossil snakes. When it comes to the big snake family tree, 
Most studies position Najash as an early offshoot, not directly linked to any of the snakes that we see today. Number 17, Paleophis colesius. Okay, let's plunge into the world of sea snakes. We've got around 52 species of them, so we better get started. <laughs> Just joking. And they all come with a venomous bite. Most of these guys prefer to hang out in the warm waters of the Pacific and Indian oceans. Generally speaking, they're relaxed creatures and won't go on the offensive unless they're provoked. Okay, so calm down. Before we stumbled upon Paleophis colossus, an ancient and now extinct, thank God, sea snake, the title for the world's largest sea snake went to the yellow sea snake, which can stretch up to three meters. But Paleophis is something special. Back in 1999, researchers found a fossil of this behemoth in Mali Sahara Desert, specifically in what we believe was once the Trans-Sahara Seaway. Judging from the fossil, this giant snake could have reached lengths of 12 meters. That's a whole nine meters longer than our previously mentioned yellow sea snake. And during the era of Paleophis and the drying up of the African Seaway, there were plenty of other big creatures around. This roster of giants included massive whales, elongated catfish, and sizable turtles. Number 16, Sanajay. Meet Sanajay indicus, a snake chilling in a dinosaur nest, complete with three eggs and one baby dino. Looking at this ancient snapshot, it really seems like we've caught a predator in action rather than just some random critters who coincidentally shared the same hangout spot. The snake's position is telling. Its head rests on a coil and its body encircles a cracked egg. Everything looks surprisingly intact. The snake, the dino, even the broken egg. The scene paints a picture of these creatures getting abruptly trapped and swiftly covered by sediment. Sanajet goes way back, around 67 million years. Still, the world only got wind of this snake 26 years after its discovery. In 1984, Dananjay Mohabe unearthed this fascinating specimen near the Indian village of Doli Dungri. He identified the baby dino and remnants of the egg, but he didn't delve much deeper. Then Jeffrey A. Wilson from the University of Michigan caught up with Mohabe and took another gander at the find. <laughs> he was blown away. It was clear, those were snake vertebrae embracing the baby dinosaur. Number 15. Mad Soya. Mad Soya is a long gone snake that roamed the earth roughly 90 million to 2 million years ago, stretching from the late Cretaceous period right through to the Pleistocene period. Its discovery goes back to Argentina in the 1930s and it was George Gaylord Simpson who christened it in 1933. One of the cool things about Mad Soya is its standout role as a representative of a genus rather than just a single species. In simpler terms, it's like a poster child for the Mad Stoi Day, which, by the way, are believed to be the ancestors of today's snakes. These creatures were globetrotters, making their presence felt everywhere over 88 million years ago. But the million dollar question is, how did these ancient serpents tie into our modern snakes? The jury's still out on that one. Mad Stoia was a nine meter slithering giant. However, some discovered specimens measured a mere three meters. So it's a guessing game about their actual size. Its hunting style probably wasn't too different from today's boas. Imagine Mad Soya coiling around its dinner, giving the old squeeze till the prey couldn't breathe, basically suffocating it, or triggering a heart attack. No rush after that, it would simply swallow its meal whole and digest leisurely. Number 14, Round Island Burrowing Boa. The Round Island Burrowing Boa, or Boliaria molto carinata is no longer with us. This snake was unique. It was the only species in the Boliaria family and genus. Last spotted in 1975 on Round Island, there aren't any known subspecies left. Typically, they reach a length of around one meter, though some captured ones measured between 54 to 140 centimeters. Color-wise, it sported a light brown hue with blackish spots on its back and a pink belly adorned with similar spots. With a round head and body plus a pointy nose, it's a good bet that this snake loved to burrow. Its closest living cousin is the Round Island boa, or Casaria dusumieri. Interestingly, this boa's entire habitat spanned just about 1.5 square kilometers. It favored spots with hardwood and palm trees, mainly hanging out on islands like Gunner's Coin, Flat Island, Round Island, and Ile de la Paz in Mauritius. Its last known home was Round Island. As of 1994, the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species marked this snake as extinct. By 1949, it was already a rare sight, and after 1975, it vanished. Sadly, its demise was partly due to invasive goats and rabbits munching away its habitat, leading to soil erosion. Number 13, Wonambi. 
Wanambi was an ancient snake, part of the Madstoids family, that called Australia home from the late Neogene to the Quaternary periods. Interestingly, these snakes weren't related to Aussie pythons. Instead, they were all about the squeeze. They were constrictors. Australia's first fossil evidence of an extinct snake is credited to Naracort, South Australia. And you guessed it, it was a Wonambi Naracortensis. The name Wonambi was inspired by Aboriginal lore. Local legends told tales of a dreamtime snake, known to some as the Rainbow Serpent. This legendary creature, recognized by both Aboriginal communities and Europeans, was often hailed as the architect of significant landscape features. Some reckon that the Noongar people's language in Western Australia has echoes of the Wanambi language from South Australia. They call it Wagil. And just to connect the dots, this language has ties to the Yurlungur genus found in Northern Territory and Queensland River Slay. About 55 million years ago, the Madstoide family had their demise in many global regions. But down under in Australia, the story was different. New species of this family kept popping up. These Aussie variants are the last we know of with the last ones fading away around 50,000 years ago. The type species W. Naracortensis was a sizable 4 to 6 meters. Its cousin, W. Barrier, was a bit shorter, clocking in under 3 meters. Neither had venom. Their strategy was all about the ambush, wrapping around their prey and squeezing the life out. And with their tiny heads, they weren't exactly gobbling down giants. Number 12. Yurlungur Yurlungur is one of those ancient snakes from the Madstoid group, just like Wonambi. Now, this snake had a bit of a squeeze-hug approach to dinner. It coiled around its prey and gave it the squeeze until, well, it was no more. What's super cool about Yurlungur is that it might have one of the best preserved skulls in its snake family. This precious skull was dug up near freshwater, hinting that maybe Yurlungur was the kind of snake that lurked in the water, waiting to surprise its next meal. The name Yurlungur is borrowed from what people in Arnhemland used to call the Rainbow Serpent back in the day. And if you take a good look at them, they seem to have more in common with Varanus, or monitor lizards, than those tiny burrowing lizards. Expert John Scanlon points to this as evidence suggesting snakes evolved from these guys, and not from the legless burrowing ancestors. Some of the star fossils from this species include a super rare skull and jawbone combo, perfectly preserved in the soft limestone of freshwater. This kind of fossil is a gem, since during the fossil making process, skulls and jaws tend to break apart. This treasure was unearthed in Northwest Queensland at the River Slay site. By 2018, some snake experts thought this genus might have been a digging master, what they call fossorial, a fancy term for critters that dig and live mostly, but not all the time, underground. Think of badgers, naked mole rats, and even some beetles and spiders. They're all part of this earth moving club. Number 11, Tacharachis. Pachyrachis is a name that's got some ancient Greek flair to it. It's a blend of pakos, meaning thick, and prakis, that's spine to us. This old snake was unique because it had some real back legs. Want to know where it was found? Ain Yabrud, a place near Ramallah in the central western bank. As for its size, it wasn't exactly huge. It maxed out a bit over 1.5 meters. There's evidence that Pachyrachis was a marine snake. Its fossils popped up in marine limestone and its rib and vertebrae bones were thick, probably helping it dive in those ancient Cretaceous seas without just floating on top. Interestingly, Pachyrachis is among a select group of three snake genera from the Cenomanian era that had hind legs. And while some of today's pythons and boas have tiny leg-like spurs, this snake had miniature legs with actual hip, knee, and ankle joints. Snake guru Haas gave us a heads up about Pachyrachis in 1979 and 1980 pointing out its cool blend of snake and lizard. Number 10, Tetrapodophus. Tetrapodophus is a pretty fancy name, <laughs> not gonna lie, that breaks down to four-footed snake in Greek. This ancient creature, which lived in Brazil during the early Cretaceous period, looked a lot like a snake but had four legs. <laughs> There's some talk about Tetrapodophus being one of the early members of the Ophidia group, which is basically snakes and their long gone cousins. However, not everyone's on board with this. Some folks are convinced that it's more of a dolicosaurid and isn't really snaky at all. Let's talk about those legs. They're on the shorter side, and it doesn't seem like this creature used them for much walking or digging. Instead, with their tiny palms and longer fingers, these legs look like they could grab onto stuff, like a sloth or certain birds. One expert even suggests that those weird spoon-like feet might have been handy for gripping prey or even, well, mates. 
this was a snake <laughs> that liked to snuggle. Interestingly, the evolution of a snake-like body has happened at least 26 times in the squamate group, producing various legless lizards. Some examples are the European slow worm, or the peculiar worm lizard bipes, which ditched its legs but kept the front ones. Actual snakes are just one result of these evolutionary experiments. While some features of Tetrapodophis are seen in other legless lizards, only snakes possess a unique combination, backward pointing teeth, a singular row of belly scales, the specific way their vertebrae connect, and a relatively short tail. Compared to lizards and crocs, whose tails can match their body length, a snake's tail, everything past the hip, is pretty short. So that seems to put the Tetrapodophis squarely in the snake camp, in spite of those sus-looking legs. Number 9. Baby snake fossil found in amber. Here's some cool news. Scientists recently came upon the oldest baby snake fossil ever. This tiny discovery locked away in amber from Myanmar can shed light on how these slithering creatures evolved over time. Just for a little timeline check, this little fella named Xiaofis Myanmarensis roamed the earth even before the T-Rex did. And it's showing us bits of snake evolution that were kind of a mystery until now. Take the V-shaped bone spurs on the bottom of its tail vertebrae. They likely protected an artery and might have helped early snakes keep balanced after ditching their legs. One small detail has kept an air of mystery surrounding this baby snake. Our little fossil is missing its skull, which could have given more juicy details about its life and lineage, but hey, finding one snake in Burmese amber means there could be more out there just waiting for their time to shine. Number 8. Denelicia Now let's check out the Denelicia patagonica. This stem snake seems to be a close cousin to the original ancestor of today's snakes. After finding a fossil, scientists used some fancy CT scanning to get a 3D look inside its inner ear. What they found were three standout parts, a big spherical vestibule, a sizable foramen oval, and some slim semicircular canals. Here's why it's cool. That spherical vestibule is like a VIP feature for burrowing snakes. You won't find it in snakes that live in water or that can chill both on land and in water. It's just for the diggers. This particular setup means they're tuned into low-frequency ground vibes more than air ones. Dinalicia patagonica is a bit of a star when it comes to land snakes from the Cretaceous era. It hung out in what's now Argentina during the late Cretaceous. This particular specimen boasted 24 vertebrae in its mid and rear section. The name Dinalicia stems from certain physical traits it had. On to the big debate. Where did snakes first evolve? on land or in the sea. There are hints suggesting a kinship between snakes and mosasaurs, indicating an oceanic origin. But the inner ear of Dinalicia looks a lot like other land-loving squamate snakes, so maybe, just maybe, our friend Dinalicia was more of a land lover. Number seven, Eupodophus. This is Eupodophus. It's an ancient snake from the late Cretaceous period that had tiny back legs, even though it wasn't walking around on them. Experts reckon it might have been a bridge between Cretaceous lizards and the no-leg snakes we know today. These small, leggy bits are more for show than any actual use. They call them vestigial. The species, Eupodophus descoensi, got its name in 2000 as a tribute to Didier Descoens, a French nature enthusiast. If you're ever in Beirut, Lebanon, drive by the MIM Museum's paleontology section to see this fellow. The specimen they used to identify it was an amazing 92 million years old and stretched out to 90 centimeters. The specimen was discovered in limestone near Al Namura village in Lebanon. You can think of Eupodophis as a sea snake cruising through the Tethys Ocean, which is kind of like a chapter in the Mediterranean Sea's history book. It had a sleek body and a tail fit for paddling. Its bones were pretty dense so they could thrive in the water. Its pelvis was tiny and loosely connected. And while there were still some foot bones, they weren't your usual ones. They weren't any of the regular foot bones like metatarsals or phalanges. I mean, come on. Eupodophis might have ditched its front legs and downsized its back ones to be a better swimmer. Think about it. Present-day snakes can wiggle on land or twist in water. Having big limbs isn't the best look if you're aiming for a smooth swim. So perhaps Eupodophis and its buddies let go of those limbs for a smoother, energy-saving glide. Number six, Ao Constrictor. Next up, we have the mighty Ao Constrictor an ancient snake from Germany's Eocene era. This critter from the Messel pit might have had the ability to see infrared light. We've got a handful of well-preserved specimens of its type, E. fisheri, that were found out in that same pit. Originally, Stefan Schall dubbed it Paleopython fisheri in 2004. But after a closer look, it was clear this wasn't just any regular snake family member. 
So in 2020, voila, it got its new name, Ao Constrictor. Size-wise, these Boyd snakes were sitting around the two meter mark. They stand out from the crowd with some unique features, a toothless premaxilla with split vomerian processes, maxilla with four little face holes and 15 to 18 teeth, palatine holding five teeth, and the list goes on. Even though Ao Constrictor's build might remind you of Boidae ancestors, let's hold fire on that comparison before we jump to any snaky conclusions. <laughs> We're still learning about fossil Boids, and it's not all clear cut. Consider our friend from earlier, Titanoboa serahonensis, that massive aquatic snake from the Paleocene in Colombia. If we confirm its Boid connections and fish eating ways, then the lifestyles and habitats of early boas might have been way more diverse than we previously thought and that could affect our understanding of the Ao Constrictor too. Number five, Coniophis precedens. A Yale team made a pretty wild discovery about a snake that existed around the time of the T-Rex. They're saying it's the oldest snake we've ever known about. This finding could mix things up in the snake origin discussion. The team's report points out that snakes probably come from land-based critters, not sea ones, and it all began when lizards started evolving longer, limbless bodies for digging. Meet Coniophis precedens an ancient sort of snake. It's like a mashup, a snake body, lizard head. It's a rare look into a transitional stage, shedding light on how snakes and lizards went their separate ways. This creature's jaws didn't move like our modern snakes, so it was likely munching on smaller things like salamanders or tiny lizards. Today, most adult snakes have unhinging jaws, allowing them to chow down on bigger prey. This edge helped snakes diversify big time. The funny thing is that for over a century, all we knew about Coniophis was from one lonely vertebra. <laughs> we were clueless about its life or its place in snake history, but after digging up more overlooked tiny bones, Longridge's squad managed to sketch out a more detailed profile of this ancient creature. Number four, Boy Peba taioensis. The Boy Peba is an intriguing genus of blind snakes that once lived in Brazil during the late Cretaceous period, specifically post Chironian. Unfortunately, they've since gone extinct. There's only one known species from this genus, Boypepa tayasuensis. And guess what? Our entire understanding of this species comes from a single pre-cloacal vertebra found in the Adamantina Formation in Northwest Sao Paulo. Boypepa was part of the Scolicophidian group. For those unfamiliar, this group consists of the blind snakes that are still slithering around today. While we've known from the phylogenetic studies that blind snakes and all other living snakes branched off a while back, think late Jurassic or early Cretaceous, we didn't have any Mesozoic fossils of blind snakes to prove it. That was, of course, until Boy Peba was discovered. Interestingly, one thing setting Boy Peba apart from many blind snakes nowadays is its size. It was pretty big. Only two existing species, the African Aphrodiflops schlegeli and Aphrodiflops murcuruso match up in size. So this suggests that the OG blind snakes were probably on the larger side and they might have started to size down much later on. Number three, St. Croix Racer. The St. Croix Racer, known scientifically as Boricanophis sancticrucis, is a unique snake you'll only find on St. Croix, an island in the US Virgin Islands. And once again, alas, it might already be extinct. The name Sanctacrucis hints at its origins. It was first discovered on St. Croix Island this snake isn't tiny. Its snout to vent length can stretch about one meter. And the one first described, the holotype, measured a solid 1.27 meters with a tail length of 43 centimeters. Oh, and fun fact, it lays eggs. Its preferred stomping grounds include the Xeric forests of St. Croix. So why do we think it might be extinct? Well, no one spotted one since the holotype was found over a century ago. Considering St. Croix is a bustling island and this snake isn't exactly small, if it did vanish, invasive mongooses might have feasted on it or maybe its leafy homes were chopped down. But don't lose hope, other Caribbean reptiles thought to be gone for good have been rediscovered. Who knows, a tiny community of these racers, maybe less than 50, could still be out there on St. Croix. Fingers crossed. Number two, Manatiflops carrier. The Manatiflops carrier was a unique species of blind snake found only in Mauritius. But in another sad loss, this one is also no longer with us. The snake was named in honor of Paul Carrier, a devoted naturalist who contributed to the Museum National de Histoire Naturelle between 1876 and 1930. Around the turn of the 20th century, Carrier unearthed the remnants of this species at Mar aux Songes. 
Our understanding of what this snake looked like is based on just a few findings, seven fossil vertebrae from its midsection, which include two sets of connected vertebrae and a standalone one. Here's something interesting. This snake was considerably larger than the Ramphotyphlops brahminus, a blind snake that continues to reside in Mauritius. We're talking about a length probably exceeding 200 millimeters. Additionally, T. Carrier stood out due to its uniquely shaped vertebrae. By 1994, the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species had declared this species extinct. It's believed that its exit from the world happened around the 17th century, thanks to the introduction of predatory species to Mauritius. Number one. Samophis Odysseus. Dr. Georgios Georgalis, a Greek paleontologist, stumbled upon a fascinating discovery. While examining fossils from the late Miocene era in Salobrea, southern Spain, he identified a previously unnamed prehistoric snake. In a nod to its lengthy migration from Africa to Asia, he christened it Samophis Odysseus after the legendary traveler from Homer's epic. Not only does it shed light on the snake species from that era in Salobrea, but its existence around 5.5 million years ago also coincides with the Messinian salinity crisis. For those not in the know, this was a time between 5.96 to 5.33 million years ago when the Mediterranean Sea underwent dramatic drying spells. Imagine that vast stretches of the sea turning into desert-like landscapes. This all came about due to the Strait of Gibraltar closing up causing the Mediterranean to dry out significantly. As for Samophis odysseus, there are some subtle differences in its vertebrae compared to its modern counterparts, but in terms of size, it's in the same ballpark, with an average length reaching up to a meter. Did you ever imagine that there were so many wonderful snakes in the past? What's your opinion on snakes? Love them or hate them? Let us know in the comment section below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now.